Welcome to the cartoon bed. It is hot. This is a very warm Bob Eckstein speaking in the third party with my co-host Michael Shaw. Hi, Bob. And that was the house band 11 Acorn Lane, who are on fire. Whew. And our producer, Marty. Marty, are you keeping cool? I am keeping cool. Um, well, it's good to see you. It is very hot in Brooklyn. I don't have air conditioning, so I just keep uh, taking layers of clothing off. So we'll see, see how your, this meeting goes. You're back from Delaware. I'm going back to the beach ASAP. What? Oh, I, I have the joke of the day. What is the joke of the day? What did Delaware? Oh, God. A, a moo moo? A New Jersey. Oh, that is that is a good joke. Wow. That is pretty good. It, it started off pretty sad, but. You joke of the day, up. everyone. You a new it. feature on the cartoon pad. What did Delaware? A New Jersey. What did Delaware? I don't know. Alaska. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, no, don't worry. We can another cut another one. Out. God, this is. This I'm on a roll. I'm on a Kaiser. I, you know, I've been on vacation, by the way, so it's nice to get back. I live in Manit. I live in Manitowoc, and I vacationed in Sheboygan. So, a man of the world. I know, a man of a very small world, <laughs> but uh, it's filled with cheese brats and beer. So why would anyone want to leave? <laughs> I am. Um... I'm over here in Pennsylvania and it is really hot. There's no air conditioning. It's very old school here. I have a swamp cooler going on and I'm sitting on a frozen bag of beans. <laughs> You're sitting on a keg of ice. Yeah. No, I'm serious. Do you guys know? I mean, I know Michael knows what a swamp cooler is. That they yeah. were popular in the 1920s in Orleans. Is that a big fan? No, it's a box and you put ice in it and you put water in it. And it just kind of has a small fan that blows the uh, vapors from the ice into your face, hopefully. You know, Michael, when I told people I was going to do a funny podcast with you, they laughed. Well, no one's laughing now. Yeah, who's laughing now? No Zero one. People. No. <laughs> you know, I was just thinking about how crazy this business is. And, and most people listening are cartoonists. And, um, you know, 15 years ago, I was... I just started out doing cartoons. I was thinking about this today that I did it about for 20 different places, 20 different publications. Now I'm not doing it for anyone except for corporate corporations or private entities. And no one sees the cartoons. <laughs> well, you just, become a privateer. Well, it's just, it just goes to show how, how weird this business is that you worked. You start off in the beginning, you're working for crowds. And now you're working for a handful. It's cyclical. Uh, you know, things go up and down. And I feel like the cartoon real estate has gotten very small of places that are publishing cartoons. And I feel like that's going to swing back. And it's going to be, yeah. you know, people and I want to add, appreciate them. I want to add that Marty's speaking in terms of also, he's also the cartoon editor for the Weekly Humorous. So he's in the thick of it, and I'm glad you chimed in because I'm interested in hearing your view. And, and Michael, what are your thoughts on that? What I just said, do you have a take on it? I wasn't paying attention. I'm sorry. Come on. Could you? Oh, I'm getting. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of. I have to say, okay, I, I, I do a lot of, not a lot, but I do the copywriting for uh, cartoon stock and yeah. cart. Uh, the other part of it called anyway it's it's like the google of cartoons i call it the giggle of cartoons and they are trying to take cartoons and put them where they've never gone before because that's where the market now is so and that's kind of difficult because it's like one newsletter at a time one website at a time so it's very decentralized and the niche within the niche so i think music's like that now too isn't it i mean i think you're right yeah i mean michael did you get a little bit more like inspired working over at the cartoon stock 
you know, you're you're closer to the cartoons. Uh, like working uh, in a bakery, did you put on some weight? Get, this part will get added. Uh, yes, I did. That's good. No, it's it's interesting because there are just now there are not only so many cartoons and so few places to put them, it just keeps growing. <laughs> There's like yeah. a million cartoons with nowhere to go. I think maybe you and me though need to spend a, a little more time together talking about cartoons because when we did in the beginning before the podcast, you and me were exchanging cartoons and talking yes. shop. And it, I think cartoonists do need feedback and they do need a little bit of encouragement and you were helpful to me. And maybe we need a little bit of that coming uh, down the road. Let's get together in woodshed. Yeah. Um, I don't I have, have air conditioning. Can I go to your place? <laughs> I had a funny, uh, so uh, I get random people that will submit and they're not always professional cartoonist level. Maybe they're, you know, they're just getting into it or maybe they've had a lot of stuff in it's interesting because not everyone that does the New Yorker or New York Times, but but maybe you'll get Wall Street Journal every now and then, or maybe you'll yes. get something else. Like maybe you'll get a Saturday Evening Post. Like you, there's other places that are, are a different tone, and they're not New Yorker people because maybe New Yorker is too intimidating. So I'll get like some maybe more people I, I don't really see very often, and I'll, I'll randomly get a submission from them. And yeah. I got someone today that I'd never even heard of, and I, his cartoons are so. They're very Shaw like. I thought. Uh -oh. I think that's, that's why all I, I need. like them. That's, I like them. that's all I need is another yeah, Shaw like. Was his name William? No. Okay. His name is David. But they were. Oh, they were, I, I know that guy. They were oh like, my God. do you know they, a David? I know a David who I was working <laughs> with. I Does it begin with a G? His last name? Yeah. 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 I, I too. Oh, it's, it's Davy and Goliath. I thought I, I put up a, a cartoon of his today that it's really simple. And I gotta leave. I'm going to go look at it. And I liked it because it was just like, it was kind of old school in that real, this could have been in the forties. And I kind of like that. I like some jokes that are was he not work? modern. Oh, really? I'm I've been tutoring this. some people on the side. Well then uh -oh. th you should be taking a victory lab. Cause I think this guy's, uh, I thought he was funny. It's like I, 92 degrees here. I'm not taking any Laps, wait, laps. wait, wait. You tutored this guy? Yeah. I have a group of people who have come to me to, to get tutored. They're taking bread out of your mouth. But he's putting, well, more, been, bread. He's putting more of their bread into his mouth, though. So well, that's, I mean, that's true. I bet. I don't <laughs> I, encourage. No, I don't encourage shame, him to do cartoons. As, as, as long as someone's getting bread. That's right. <laughs> no, half well, the time I talk about them trying to do other things and, and to use their humor for other reasons, different ways, and not to count on the New Yorker. I mean, I, I totally say to them, that is like very, very hard. And by the way, you brought up the Wall Street Journal. The, world, the Wall Street Journal just contacted me and they're not going to be buying cartoons for a while. It's another oh, market really? that kind of stopped. Not even Barron's? Well, Barron's stopped altogether. What is wrong with these people? It's not like cartoons. And, uh, I mean, cartoons add such a panache to any publication. I know. They need a They're break. Like, we all need a break. I need cartoons a break. are like uh, a Kit Kat oh. bar Ooh. or uh, when people would smoke and it wouldn't be bad for them. It'd be like a cigarette break. You just need a break. <laughs> and a cartoon is that break. <laughs> I need a break. We'll be right back. Break me off a piece of that cartoon. Dun, yeah, dun. break me off a piece of that cartoon <laughs> gag. That's today's sponsor. Oh, cartoon gag? Kit Kat. Kit Kat. But did you see the cartoon I posted, Bob? Was this one of your students? I didn't see. I know that he was going to send work your way, and I didn't get a chance to take a look because I actually had no internet access until just about the time we were about to take. Shaw, did you look it up and look? No, no, it's amazing. I got the son got an internship, and Bob's protege got a cartoon, and and we knew nothing about it. Did you see? But did you see the cartoon that I'm saying no. is kind of Shaw like? I, I'm going to look right now. I'll be back. First of all, there's no of a Michael Shaw. Thank God. Well, I have and, a twin brother. Oh my God, that's right. He has an evil twin. Or are that's you right. the no, evil I, twin? No, I'm the evil twin. In fact, <laughs> in fact, 
I got a t-shirt that says I am the evil twin, but he's a big fan and he's loving the podcast and he loved the Sam Gross episode. And he What's says, your brother's name? Patrick. It's Pat and Mike. Pat and Mike. So you can tell a Pat and Mike joke. So Pat comes up to Mike. And he says, what you digging the hole for? He goes, I'm not digging the hole. I'm digging the dirt. I'm leaving the hole. <laughs> you know, it all comes back to digging holes. When That's I was right. doing the book with Michael last year, I can't tell you how many times Michael said he couldn't work on something or we couldn't do a meeting because he was in a hole. Yes. Uh, I have some famous in a hole photographs from different houses, including this one, because every house I buy is leaky. So I have to go find the leak. <laughs> leaky basements. So, leaky basements, leaky subfloors, leaky crawl spaces. And they go, where's Michael? He goes, hey, he's out looking for a leak. Yeah, Michael moved because he fixed all the leaks in the one house. That's true. There was a, well, didn't you tell me there was like a clog in one of your pipes and you used the clog to fix a leak in another? It's like, <laughs> crazy story. Uh, that's a good story, but no, I didn't tell you that. Oh, something. Well, How do you fix a leak with a clog? This better be good as the Jersey joke. Oh, no, that's, I'm asking the question now. Delaware? Oh, that's the this is, this is great. So we have question corner wow, for okay. the cartoonists. Okay, I need cartoon. I'm at the website, but I, I'm seeing that. Where's your cartoon of the day? Well, it's at weeklyhumorous.com. You have to scroll down. I'm scrolling. I'm scrolling. And it's like oh. the second thing that's there is a little. Second thing. Ah. Uh. It's the same. Oh, is it all thing. nuts? Is it all nuts? It is all nuts. Hell, that does look like my drawing. You, you Judas, you've created another me. I don't need that. Well, I haven't seen the cartoon oh, that's, yet. That's pretty good. I have to admit it. That's not bad. What's well, not that? bad? It because like, there's, I, you know, why I like it. Also, I like cartoons that have no captions. If you can be, so does, so does man no call. caption. It's great. Oh, bully for you. Hey, I'm getting a, I'm getting a paywall. You should subscribe to Weekly Humorous Show. Yeah, uh, everyone should. How am I supposed to pay for these cartoons if no one, no one pays, no one buys a subscription? <laughs> I don't, I don't. Michael, those who can't, can't teach, teach. I those know. who can't teach, teach Jim. No, teach Art. Woody, Woody, Woody <laughs> Allen. No, no, I. Yeah, I know. I've I've used that joke many times. I can only see half of it, but I I think that's. I well, think you're looking probably, at the funny half. Yeah, I am. The the trees. Who knew trees had. So Groins. I'll describe the cartoon to our listeners at home, but it's, it's a man playing golf and he's, he's, he's getting his shot ready to go onto the green and there's a bunch of trees blocking and he's trying to hit it through the trees and he's getting his shot and all the trees branches are down covering their pretend, I guess, private parts. Yes, they're groins. They're well, groins. maybe it's, maybe it's crotch mahogany. Is that a real thing? Crotch mahogany? Yes, of course. He looks Michael like- Michael gets the, royalties on those. He reminds me, that's very old school throwback too. He reminds me of a cartoonist whose name I can't recall at the moment, but he, he, was, he was very popular in the New Yorker back in the day, much beloved by uh, Mr. Uh, Harold Ross. So this is a cartoonist named David Gom Gomberg. Is that how I say it, Bob? Yep, that's how you say it. Look at that. That's how, that sounds Bob, like a- Bob's students, without me knowing- has gotten through the gatekeeper of comedy at the lowest level, of course. He was he's very a... good. He's very good. He's very good learning. Very nice guy. He took just one thing with me because he only needed one thing. And um, what'd you give him? Look at this, Bob. Bob is a kingmaker. He I know. Just, he can just twist. He can just. He give you a little adjustment, and boom, you're ready to go. It's like a. It's like a super coach. Cartoon coach. Okay, I'm gonna log in here and Bob subscribe. Bob Eckstein, cartoon coach. That's gonna be the next. No, actually, adventure. I tell you, cartoon whisperer has cartoon kingmaker. People have said cartoon whisperer. The people came like to me with their batches and they asked me to punch it up. Whatever. Well, this. I mean, congratulations. You're obviously doing something uh, right. If if okay, I'm guy... gonna start sending you my batches again. You can fix <laughs> yeah. them. You he keeps wanting them. me. He keeps wanting me to put washes in and i go like come on pa i would love to do the washes for your cartoons no no my 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 cartoons are on wash just like me 
<laughs> great unwashed. Yeah. The great unwashed. They have to be spot. flinty. Do you want to make a whole episode on spot color? Uh. We'll talk about that for two hours. Yeah. Our next guest is at the top of the children's book mountain and one of the most accomplished cartoonists in the business. He won the gold medal of the Art Directors Club of New York before leaving advertising to become an illustrator, author, and puzzle maker. He has done 26 books for children and adults and appears regularly in the New York Times. His work has been exhibited around the world, including the Times Best Illustrations of the Past 20 Years exhibit at the Society of Illustrators. His Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs has been selected one of the New York Times Best 10 illustrated books and has sold over 6 million copies and was made into two motion pictures. And if that wasn't enough of particular interest to the cartoon pad listening audience, he, he was a mainstay of the National Lampoon, creating many pieces, including its most popular cartoon strip, Politeness Man, as well as being the last art director. And also um, here to talk about his new book, the Witch Demands a Retraction, Fairy Tale Reboots for Adults, published by Humorous Books. And I will tell you now, it's really beautiful. Welcome to the Cartoon Pad, Ron Barrett. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, you, you mentioned the uh, exhibits around the world. You know, at the, uh, the my, my art for the animals should definitely not wear clothing was hung at the, at the Louvre, but... Uh, you know those those witty French. They hung it upside down. <laughs> uh oh. So you're you were in the surrealist section. Yeah, that's right. Well, they were. It was a drawing of possums uh, hanging by their tails. So they turned the possums around oh, so that they, their heads were up and their tails were down. That's the way they serve them. So. <laughs> yeah. Ron, congratulations on your new you. book, "The Witch okay. Demands a Retraction." Thank you. Written with Melissa. Um, is it Balman? Balman. 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 Okay. Oh, like she's the, French too. Like the couturier. Yes, that's oh. right. Oui. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, she does. And all how my did clothing. you guys? How did you guys meet? Well, Michael Gerber at the American Bystander put us together. He thought we would make a great couple, and we wonderful. have made a great couple. She's great to work with. You know, she's a wonderful talent, and I really enjoyed doing these drawings that gave me the opportunity to work on this uh, coquille paper. Speaking of uh, French, I would go down to uh, Pearl Art Supplies on uh, Canal Street. You remember Pearl? Yeah, long yeah. gone. Long gone. I, would I remember go down Pearl, there. she was a great gal. You used to go out with her, didn't you? Yeah, she yeah. was like, <laughs> we were between the sheets. <laughs> between the sheets of paper, probably. Exactly. Pearl. Yes. So I would go down there waiting for those sheets of paper to come in off the off the ship from France. It was called coquille paper, uh, and they didn't make it here. It uh, is a paper with a a raised stipple texture, which was used by newspaper cartoonists years and years ago. It was a way of getting a a, a tonal effect with pure lines, so that a newspaper could photograph the art as line art and it would look like tone. And wow. so, Ron, yeah. did you work with pencils so, on that paper? I worked with uh, Prismacolors. Which give oh, a okay. Nice black line. Mm -hmm. And a little looks, pen and ink. It looks beautiful. It, oh, it's a great you. looking thank book. And mm -hmm. yeah, just fabulous. So that, that technique creates a dimensionality to a line. That that's you... what, yeah, that's what I really like about it. It allowed me to model forms in a way that I couldn't do with pen and ink like I did with... Uh, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs was more like basket weaving. And this was more like working with Play-Doh. Wow. I've, yeah. I'm actually learning something despite my best efforts. <laughs> so anything else you want to anything know? Anything else. <laughs> That's it. So That's is there it, pressure? Ron. Thanks. It's great having great. you. Yeah. Right? Thanks so much for this opportunity. And now back to Valerie. All right. Hi, well, Valerie. Has well, her hair let's... out of the curlers now. Let's just get this out of the way. Get the elephant out of the room. Are we brothers? I mean, I. I think that I think that you are my long lost brother. You're from the from the South Bronx. And you grew up next to the botanical garden. No, actually, no, I'm from the South Bronx. No, no botanical gardens. That's too high class. I grew you, up in a shtetl in the ghetto of the South oh Bronx. My. Oh, okay. Because yeah. I thought you went to PS twenty. 
ES20 was there on uh, between Fox and Tiffany Street on 167th. Okay, I was yeah. at Tremont and Story. Oh, Tremont and Story, or oh, you're a classy kid. Oh, yeah, right. We, we couldn't visit each other because we'd get beat up if we walked to each other. I didn't get beat up so much in the South Bronx. I got beat up when we moved to Washington Heights and those Irish kids used to chase me around the neighborhood and grab my beret and throw it up on the fire that's escape. Right. Oh, and that's right. I would have we... to go upstairs and find out what apartment belonged to that fire escape and knock on their door and could I come in and get my beret from your fire escape? Oh, please, Ron. Good times. Those were all fun times. <laughs> now, I... I did you, wait, is... excuse me. Did you ask in French? <laughs> well, I used to pretend that I was French twins. I was ah. and Pierre because I had no brother because Bob was killed at Pearl Harbor. Of course. Uh, so I would pretend that I had two brothers. They were French, uh, Jacques and Pierre. And one day, Jacques would show up at some girl's apartment and knock on the door and say, Hello, I am Jacques. I would need to take you out. And she would get the door <laughs> slammed in his face. The next day I would show up as uh, Pierre. Uh, Pierre, hello. I am here to take you out on the town and show you the <laughs> Eiffel Tower. And I would get the door slammed in my face. So I was rejected twice, but as <laughs> different people. Did you try the pen? <laughs> you should have drawn so a little, little pencil thin mustache. Yeah, that, well, that I, had, I had the beret occasionally when I could get it off the fire escape. Okay. <laughs> Ron, yeah. where did you grow up uh, also in Fort Washington? Because I'm there now at 190th and Fort Washington oh, uh, Avenue. Oh, over there. Yeah, almost border in the far. That's where my mother lived. You could probably be. She lived at. Um, well, mom. Yeah, mom. Avenue right next to Fort Tryon Park. Yeah, that's so, mom. So what's the number of the house? Well, I live at 680. I, I can give people my six... also my social security number. <laughs> She lived at 670. You could go over there. She'll cook a nice meal for you. Oh, Fort Tyron Park is beautiful now. If you go yeah. back, yeah, it's really. So how was it for you growing up in the Bronx and in that neighborhood? Well, you you know, aside memories? from getting uh, my beret stolen, it was okay. And got, uh, getting beat up, it was fine. I used to go to art high school, though. I mean, I had a lot of art training. I went to the High School of Industrial Art, right. you know, where people learn things like leathercraft and sign painting. Well, also you had your dad. Your dad was really into cartooning as My well. My dad was a great cartoonist. Yes, he was. For him, it was a, a road not taken. He, he was a sign painter in Jersey City, then uh, went to uh, work in Manhattan in a warehouse where he shot rats at night with a, a 45 caliber handgun and uh, then eventually transferred to the bookkeeping department because he had such beautiful handwriting. He was a sign painter. Mm. and met my mom there. And then a few years later, he saw an ad, I think in the Journal American newspaper from uh, Walt Disney. They were looking to hire cartoonists to work on this movie called Snow White. So my father wrote to, uh, to Burbank and uh, got the application. And I mean, he could have aced the test. He was such a great cartoonist. You know, but he, he pulled a heater during the interview and that was <laughs> <Right>. it. <laughs> Back in that rod. Yeah, like he put the gat. He put the gat in Walt's <laughs> ribs and says, "Listen, buddy, yeah. you need my talents." I wish he should. I wish he did. But, but as uh, a kid, you also wanted to work for Disney, right? I did. I wrote that uh, little essay when I was in the third grade that I wanted to work for Walt Disney. So it was a road not taken for my dad. He got the test. He never filled it out. He never completed it, and put it in the desk drawer. And there it stayed for many years until I ultimately gave it to uh, an illustrator in L.A. named Bob Zoll. Uh, I kept the letterhead, though. It was a beautiful drawing of Mickey in orange and black. And it was at the old studios, um, got Hyperion Avenue Studios. That was the original home of the mouse. So, yeah, it was a road not taken for him, but he influenced me. I love to uh, sit at the kitchen table and watch him draw magic came out of his pencil and i thought wow there's that like, talent. like fun yeah you, you might have inherited talent <laughs> i might have you, you might have been the first cartoonist goals. to do that mm. he was great he was a natural and but he wound up working in a liquor store and having a 45 caliber gun put against his head oh no well, isn't that yeah. the same as cartooning though michael isn't that that sounds <laughs> liquor and the gun to the head it's all ring, you know, ring true yeah 
Yeah. I would like to say so, that Ballantine is a fine wow, scotch. Oh, that so. is a lovely glass. Thank you. Yeah, what do you got in there? Iced tea? Uh, or what is that? <laughs> Ron, a little about... scotch and soda. Oh, no, nice. I, actually, it's a sour beer for ah, a sour cartoonist. Oh, sour beer. Where are, you, where are you getting that from? Uh, where do I get <laughs> Where it? are you anyway? Oh, I'm in lovely downtown Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Oh, great beer. Uh, so I'm in Wisconsin. I mean, I can walk outside and trip on beer. Uh huh. You know, it's that great beer that they don't export that my daughter loves. Uh, uh, there's New Glarus. The new Glarus beer. Yes. Oh, you know what? Yes. This is a New Glarus. Glarus. It is. This is. Yes. It's a wheat. No, I, the, the sour <laughs> beer was earlier. I'm sorry. He's it's a little wheat drunk. beer. A wheat Just beer. little. It's like being a little pregnant. Um, no, it's uh, there's Spotted Cow. Uh huh. Uh, Another totally great naked. one. Yeah, with uh, cheese curds. Oh yeah, fried cheese. Yeah. You have to fry them to bring out their goodness. To, right. Uh -huh. And so, a crinkle. Uh, my daughter went to University of Wisconsin Madison. Oh, I work at and the University of Wisconsin a, Green Bay. Oh, go ahead. We went. Oh, she married a, a Wisconsin. Well, you don't call them. Uh, what do you? Uh, a uh, a cheese head. What is that? A cheese head. No, a Bucky. Bucky the. Oh yeah, so Bucky badger. The, Bucky the badger. She married Bucky the a badger. badger. She married than, a badger. Better than Pete the possum, you know. <laughs> she married a badger who badgered her throughout their entire marriage. Oh my! And, uh, that has now ended. So Did no they... more, no more New Glarus uh, coming east. Oh, that's too bad. From you could you could still have a nice line in Kugel. <laughs> they export that. Oh yes, yeah. I think so. Well, I'm not okay. sure. But it's beer about, talk, everyone. Enough about beer talk. Yeah, well, we got like Not 40 good though. minutes from Michael before he's totally soused. Yeah, I so just take advantage of this. <laughs> I burn hot and fast. Uh, <laughs> that's just that part of his splendor. Mm, yes. Yeah. So Ron, I like let's the move, curtains. Yeah, Ron, let's move on to, uh, to Pratt Institute. You went to my alumni, and I would like to know um, how did you enjoy going to Pratt Institute? It's like in high Brooklyn? school all over again. You know, I went to the High School of Industrial Art where we had these great professional teachers who uh, you know, were working in the business. And that's how I found my job at Lucian Bernhardt studio. Uh, Lucian Bernhardt was the great pioneer of modern poster design. He did those Priester matches posters. Oh, yes. 1920s Munich and came here in the, during the uh, Nazi period to as an emigre like so many German graphic designers did and set up a studio on 55th Street. So thanks to Mr. Beagleisen, who was my teacher at the High School of Industrial Art, I found work in Bernhard's studio for two summers where I oh. grew radishes and learned that if I <laughs> did a piece of lettering, I would have to roughen up all the edges to make it look like it was cut out of stone. Oh, wow. He had to have the mark of the hand. He was a Luddite. He was a Luddite. And no wonder no wonder you called him old Beagle Eyes. <laughs> well, this is Lucian Bernard. Okay. He was a oh, Luddite. Oh, he's your mentor. He was the He master. was one of my mentors. One of your mentors. great working there. The other one and was uh, uh, was Ir Irvine Metzel, who uh. was a great designer and illustrator and president of the Society of Illustrators at that time. And I met Irvine because they, they recruited the best and the brightest to go to Saturday morning classes at, the, at uh, the Society of Illustrators, where was the first time I ever saw a nude lady. Oh my God. What's it like? We had a nude lady come in to pose for us kids. It was shocking. Oh my God. I, yeah. Ron, I know exactly what you mean. I mm. remember when I first drew a nude, I was like 15 or 16. When I was in college, I, I, I didn't finish high school. So I kind of <laughs> sat in on college classes. Uh -huh. And I had one of those big pads that are like made of newsprint, like they're yes. super absorbent. And I had my <laughs> inkwell. And as soon as she disrobed, I knocked over the ink <laughs> and the whole pad just absorbed it <laughs> like a sponge and it just went black. <laughs> and I was just like totally freaked out because okay. I'm such a prude. I, you know, I went to Catholic school and I'm just like, went from zero to 60 in 10 seconds <laughs> and uh, it blew my mind. But 
that was Pratt Institute oh. too. It was like exposed to all these new things. And yeah, would, would you say Pratt was a big influence in yeah, your there work? was that male model who came in with a gold fig leaf. I remember there was a married couple in the class. They walked out when he came in with that gold fig leaf. That's funny. It was just too much. Pratt Institute, there was Herschel Levitt, who was a great teacher who you know, played Mozart for us and told us to go to the library and look at Peruvian textiles. So he kind of opened up our visual and audio, audible world in a way that no other teacher really did. And then mm -hmm. there were those great abstract expressionists teaching there at the time, like James Brooks, who was such a close friend of Jackson Pollock. He was the one who brought Pollock that Life magazine story that said, America's greatest painter. Yeah. That picture of Pollock with a cigarette in his mouth leaning on that splatter painting. And well, uh, you know, uh... Pollock was taught by uh, Benson. It, Thomas Hart Benton. Yes. And upstairs Thomas Hart at the Art Students League, the sixth floor. And I would say, I remember <laughs> first encounter, I grew up in Missouri and I was in Jefferson City, Missouri at the, or, or maybe in St. Louis. I grew up Senator in St. Louis. Benton. I was at the art museum and I encountered one of his nude paintings. Mm. And Sweet Mystery of Life at Last, I Found You. Uh huh. I was like transfixed, transposed, and turned to stone. So yeah, yeah. I said, whoa, get me to the Ozarks. Well, yes, his dad was a senator from Missouri. But it's funny because Pollock was this wild beast of a painter, and, and Benton was this classicist, and Pollock became just world famous and revered, and Benton was goes like, you know, I could have done that. <laughs> He, he kind of he, he kind of got left in the dust of time, I guess. Pollock said about his splatter drip paintings, "If I could draw a hand, I wouldn't have to do this crap." Yes, and <laughs> I actually I have a BFA in painting, and the one thing I learned from that was I can't actually draw. So it was, and all my instructors were abstract expressionists, so I got heavily into art brute and the mm. art of Jean du Buffet. Uh, and, uh -huh. and they were very impressed that I learned all these uh, uh, French uh, painters and art brute and art of the insane. They go, mm. Michael, you're really into this. I go, yeah, that's because I can't draw. <laughs> Another so. cartoon. So you work with exclusive. what you got. That's yes, good. I've worked yeah. with what I got. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. so. Yes. So oh, not only oh. was James Brooks there teaching us about the interior spaces of type forms, which were wonderful. I remember him showing us the interior space of a Caslon A, lowercase a, and admiring, teaching us how to admire negative space. And there was also Jack Twarkov there at the same time, yes. another one uh, from, the, uh, from the bar in uh, Greenwich Village, the Cedars Bar. These so, are action painters and very into the gesture of drawing. Yes. That's, and the that's action, true. the physicality of drawing. And the physicality of lifting a glass to your mouth. Yes, of course. Right. Mm -hmm. yes. But somehow you wind up then going to art direction and fail, found yourself in the advertising world. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I thought it would be a way to earn a living. So you were at Young and Rubicam. for a while. I was there. Yes, that's true. What was your... Uh, what was your favorite account? Or well, most... it was the golden age of uh, conceptual uh, advertising, I think. It was uh, the discovery of uh, the vernacular and of uh, talking to people like people before that. Uh, it was uh, you know, a men's club run by guys from Dartmouth. Then all of a sudden, all the Jewish and Italian kids came into the business and changed the complexion of the business and the tone of voice completely. So it was really- Actually, uh, I, uh, after I got my BFA in painting and I knew I couldn't paint, I went off to the University of Missouri School of Journalism and got my master's mm. degree in advertising. And my mentor in copywriting was an old Yale man by the name of Henry Hager. Uh -huh. And he might have been at Young and Rubicam for a while, but yeah. uh, he was very old school and, you know, kind of larger than life. Yeah, well, that was the age of the madman. You know, when they had to have those Dartmouth grads on staff to match the Dartmouth grads who worked for the client so they could talk to each other and play golf with each other. You know, Jewish and Italian kids were going to offer to play stickball with a client, you know. <laughs> 
I uh, would play stickball. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ron, well, me and Ron were always on the same teams. Uh, <laughs> Mom, Mom made us play on the same team. Ron, Ron, I find it really wild that you walked away from that and then you took something which I thought was a very brave road into children's book. And then I, I should mention this. You've done it all because I don't want people to think that we're talking to a children's book illustrator here. It is amazing how you've had multiple careers and you've done an underground newspaper as well as other jobs all over the place and and National Lampoon. So, Mm -hmm. um, but you walked away from advertising, which to me was very risky. Well, I realized, you know, looking around, I didn't see anybody uh, uh, in the office uh, who was over 40 years old. So I knew that unless I owned my own ad agency, I was uh, doomed to have a very short career in advertising. And that's what happened. Uh, the people who were articulate and could give uh, great presentations and uh, rose to the top of management. And uh, I did not have those skills. My skills were in my hands and in my mind, but they weren't in a presentation or client relationships. Were you so, ever, sorry, were you ever called a wrist? Give me the rest. Oh, those people down there. We were referred to as those people down there. Oh. Yeah, that the account group was above and we were down there. Uh, well, pair of hands, we would be called. Well, you're okay. the talent, Ron. You were yeah. the talent. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> those no. days, the guys that in the art department were doing watercolor renderings of minute rice, you know? <laughs> so they had to do, they had that skill to make great watercolors for presentations all yep. gone now with the age of scrap art and the computer. So well, yes, I walked away from it. I went to live uh, in the rat infested, flea infested loft on uh, Grand Street in lower Manhattan, what was later to become Soho when the lawyers moved in. But for that t- time period yeah. in Little Italy on the borders of Little Italy downtown, I had this loft and I was living La Boheme and had left my wife in Brooklyn with that multi-million, in that multi-million dollar brownstone, <laughs> which was to become a multi-million dollar brownstone while I was paying $130 a month for the rats and fleas on Grand Street. The cannoli years. The cannoli. Uh, you were yeah. pounding on the wall telling Jasper Johns and Rauschenberg <laughs> to keep it down. They were in the neighborhood. Well, uh, who else? Uh, Basquiat moved in a few years. Oh, don't you I wish left. you found one of those laying in the closet on the way out? <laughs> Did you look behind the radiator and stuff? I mean, yeah, you gotta look. we didn't have a radiator. There was no heat but uh, <laughs> for that first winter. Well, it, it was roughing you... it. I wanted to prove yeah. to myself that I could rough it. I could take it. I was meant of sterner stuff than uh, growing up in uh, comfortable surroundings. And from that, and from that gritty, bleak background, a children's illustrator was born. Yes, when I and then I moved uptown to get away from the mafia killings on my doorstep. I remember that chalk outline of the body was there for months in front of my door. (laughs) I've been down there recently. It's still there. Now, yeah. I love going down there. The cartoonists and us, we all meet over by Baxter. Uh, Baxter. Yeah. And that's where we all meet. We all meet in those places down there. They really? Well, there. The Cafe Roma is still there. Yeah. Have you yeah. been back there? I went uh, back to the cafe. Rick Myrowitz was my neighbor. He lived a couple of blocks away. And there was, he lived in one of these lofts where you have to throw the keys out the window to... Uh, let this person in downstairs. <laughs> so Rick and I would meet at the Cafe Roma for a cannoli. It was on my way home from the laundromat. Now, did you do the <laughs> underground paper, the funny papers at that yes. time, or would that come later? That, that was about that time period, the funny papers. Yeah, that was financed by Sherman Sager and his wife, Lydia. Sherman was a lawyer at, uh, I think, King, King Features or United United Features, King Features, I think. I think it's King, yeah. Yeah, King Features. So R. Crumb was drawing for it. Well, we used some of his art. And uh, Kurtzman was our cartoon editor, Harvey Kurtzman. Now, did you get a chance to work with him personally? That's great, you know, No, it was all, you know, slipped under the door. I worked with Faye Dorman. Uh, She was the paste-up artist. (laughs) Oh, wow. 
So, so we did you not... it together after hours while I was working at the children's television workshop at that time. So you was... weren't like hanging out with Robert Crumb heckling women walking by? Or... Oh, no, no. He sent in that uh, Bobo Bolinsky yeah. comic strip where I was Bobo just looking at that. Throws up into a woman's cleavage. That got, <laughs> that was really the death of that newspaper. It lasted for three inches, three inches, three <laughs> issues. So did Bobo. Three inches long. Yeah. Uh, Bobo throwing up into that woman's cleavage. But it's, it's nice to see a man wearing a fedora, I have to say. Yes. Well, uh, there was, it didn't go over well in Texas, that issue. Uh, all those well, issues, you know, Texas, Dubuque, Iowa, we can't please everyone. They were all those issues were put into a shredder, I think, in uh, Plano, Texas. So that was the the death of that uh, newspaper, which was so attractive and so funny. Uh, but the distributors just hated it because of the uh, X-rated material. <laughs> Ron, did that help? I was going to ask, did yeah. that help you get in the door with National Lampoon later? Was there a memory of your work on funny papers? No, it was a Rick who I met on, at the Cafe Roma on, on not Grand's, at, at the Cafe Roma who helped me open the door at the Lampoon. I did a, a collage called the Foodscape where I mixed uh, broccoli and pot roast with landscape material. So you didn't know if you, you were looking at a at a forest or a kohlrabi or a, or a tunnel or a, a turkey butt. Uh, and uh, I, I showed Rick these collages and he said, these are great, bring them over. And I met Tony Hendry and we created this uh, series of collages called The Wide World of Meat. And so- You know, I remember uh, these, I had all the lampoons, I was just, I was just so transfixed in the photo funnies that I didn't pay attention. Oh yeah, those. I boobies. apologize. Those black and white boobies were great. Yeah, Ron, you know our producer Marty has a little history with National Lampoon and and Tony as well. Tony Hendra. Yeah, just I mean, final I, tap. I worked there uh, from 2004, so they stopped printing, but then it flipped to digital. But it was the same. Like I worked yeah. with, I worked, you know, for Maddie Simmons was still there. So I was there when it was going just to nationallampoon.com, mm. but a lot of the old guys would keep were still were still in, in the in the orbit. So I got to meet a lot of the like I met Rick uh, Marowitz when he was putting together the Drunk Stone Brilliant Dead book. I was oh. you know I I got to be involved with when they had openings, and then they actually took that book and they turned it into a movie. And so I got to work with the documentarian when they right. turned that into a Lampoon movie. Mm. And then when they turned the Lampoon movie into the Netflix uh, Will Forte vehicle, that actually was a dramatization of it. So I kind of, oh, I got to- Right. So I got to kind of come in at the end where the people that were still around from the old Lampoon days, I got to go to all of these events and meet a lot of the guys from the 80s, some of the guys uh -huh. from the 70s. Um, so it was really interesting getting to meet uh, all, of, all of the folks that probably you got to work with when you were just starting. And, and when uh, I was ending it, 1991, uh, yeah. before I went to California, it was bought by that guy from Disney and who moved it out there. That's correct. There it was, was like- uh, Larry it was the, Doyle? Yeah. Larry it went through Doyle a lot. I mean, there. the company yeah. went through so many uh, you know, ownerships in yeah. a very short time. There was a lot of ups and downs in the mid 80s and then late 80s. Like, it's interesting when you see from someone who was working there when things were very different and it was like beyond, like it had been so many years since massive hit movies. If you look at like the movie reviews for like Christmas Vacation, they were bad. They were like, <laughs> Lampoon has lost it. This movie is terrible. <laughs> They're never gonna recover. And now we look at that as like one of the best holiday movies of all time mm -hmm. or something. So it's just the perspective of it is it was always so di so, so difficult to uh, um, live up to, like if you weren't making something that was Animal House, you're fail, you're a failure. Yeah. At that company, so that was kind of like it was a tough place to work because it was it's always like, are you? Yeah, it was a very yeah. high bar. Always this yeah. crazy, this crazy high bar from the late seventies. Mm -hmm. You know, the the golden age. And yeah. It was like we're never can do that again. But I would easily say I prefer the magazines to the movies. I mean, oh, sure, the, I the agree, movies Michael. weren't 
the movies weren't even close. Yeah, I agree. And Ron, what was the mood at the end? You know, I worked with you in those last issues. Yes, I recall. Mm -hmm. Do you want, what was the mood in your feeling about what you would be doing from there on? I mean, well, of course you I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't know what I'd be doing from there on. And then uh, the when, last uh, editor with you, Ron, was that Ratso? No, Ratso wasn't the last editor. It was uh, George. His sister was that movie star. What's her name? Uh, I can't oh. remember her name. Sorry. Something like Balsam. But, I worked okay. with Ratso. I don't remember someone after her, him. I had, I got uh, to meet Ratso two times, but I got to have, uh, we had like lunch or brunch in the village in by like Little West 12th Street. It was oh. this whole crowd of people. And he brought all this, he brought like this entourage of like funny weirdos. New York is so much fun because it's like, it's all just like funny weirdos. If you've been uh -huh. in New York a long time, the people that, if you're going to be meeting like art people, it's like the most eclectic group of people. And I just remember sitting yeah. there and I was so boring, you know, like I'm so boring <laughs> compared to these people. It's uh -huh. so much fun to hang out with people like this. You know, but I loved, yeah, Rick. I, I loved him in Midnight Cowboy. He was really. <laughs> <laughs> Their favorite uh, restaurant when I was there was Big Wong. <laughs> Chinatown. <laughs> yeah. What did they serve? Big Wong. Yeah. Marty, I, I was buddies with the guy who wrote the letters. But John Delheim, does that ring a bell, Ron? Don't know him. He used no. to write all the letters. I'm trying front. to think of George's last name. Who was the editor? But I mean, we did it. It was like guys writing uh, term papers at that time rather than writing humor. I and mean, we did an issue about gauchos. I mean, it didn't seem to be a great subject for humor. No. Did you we enjoy the movie? Writing essays about gauchos and the pampas and, uh, you know, uh, barbecued beef recipes. Yeah. Were, you, were you being, as the art director, were you doing cartoon editing also? I didn't do any cartoon editing. No, okay. it's a little cartooning, but no editing. The, that wasn't my department. I was just trying to to learn the computer and get the uh, rubber cement into the proper consistency. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. difficult. It dries out very quickly. It does. <laughs> right. One of the yeah. one of the last lampoons that I I think I have was it was a double. It was like a double magazine cover where you had two different versions and it was like the beginning of the computer age. It was like a woman coming out of the computer oh. and had this like this like open, it was like this this uh it was like this it was like a it was like a almost like a swimsuit like uh a, maybe like centerfold. a centerfold. Like, like, like a centerfold. It was kinda like uh -huh. a centerfold, but it was on the cover. And it mm. was like looking back on it, because it was so the beginning of the internet age. Yeah. And it was a really funny gag. And it was like one, of, I think it was one of the last Lampoon covers. It may have been like 91, LA? 92. Where were you at that time? Were you in LA or New York? I was, met in, I was in middle school at that time. I met uh, Razzo years later oh, I see. Uh, after the magazine was over and uh -huh. it was online. And I was working there doing nationallampoon.com. Mm. And I met him, you know, this could have been seven years ago. Uh, maybe, maybe eight years Did you ever go ago. to his apartment? That's a great museum of religious artifacts. Really? Yes, yes. Collects, uh, you know, those uh, Virgin Marys that glow in the dark and all of that sort uh, of thing. Religious kitsch. <laughs> yeah. That's great. So. And then so many of those guys from like the 80s, like Mike Reese, um, you know, they all went on to, to do The Simpsons for their entire careers. That's After true. That's true. A politeness man had his time in Hollywood. He had a shot. We, uh, I did a co uh, a commercial for uh, a um, for a, a, a phone company, uh, and the producers of that commercial, Klasky Chupo, which was a wonderful animation company, who did the Rugrats at the time, and they were doing okay. The Simpsons. I think they were the first animators of The Simpsons. So Arlene Klasky fell in love with Politeness Man and thought that these kids in America really need to learn a thing or two about keeping their elbows off the table and putting uh, you know, a doily under their drinks. Uh, and she fell in love with the character. And we tried for years uh, to get a script that her parent company, Columbia, would, ap would approve. Uh, I, the uh, Politeness Man was on retainer 
for maybe long enough, I know, to put my daughter through the University of Wisconsin at uh, those reduced, uh, reduced uh, state school rates. But uh, the, the final, so many writers tried but failed, including me, to create a script that Columbia would buy. So Did they finally, go? finally, one day, Stan Lee appears. He was working on a project with Klasky Chupo. He walks in and he sees Politeness Man. This is the greatest comic strip I have ever seen. What a wonderful idea. I want to write it. So Stan and his Hungarian co-writer go away and they come back with a script, which he claims is the best thing he has ever done. And we <laughs> thought, this is the worst thing you've ever done <laughs> and gave him some notes. And he said, notes to you, I'm walking out this project. And that was the end of uh, Politeness Man in Hollywood. So now you take that Stan Lee script, which is now gold, <laughs> and you say, hey, Marvel Universe, I have one of your new Avengers. It is Politeness Man. <laughs> yeah, or you go meta and you put Stan into the show with Politeness Man. <laughs> hey, Disney Plus needs as oh, many of these God. things as they can possibly yes. handle. You could Harry be going It's a, it's a thirsty uh, time for content. You could be going up against Loki. Like they need more heroes. Yeah. And Politeness Man is here to teach people. Well, Marty, you want to be the broker? Uh, yes, I will make it. Politeness Man happen. Yeah. People okay. need to. People need to know about coasters. Yeah. It. <laughs> That's he's all. He's all yours. He's a Ron. What were the? What was the origins of Politeness Man? He looks very. I was I was looking at him. It reminds me of Johnny Dollar from uh, the old radio series. Well, yeah, it could be Johnny Dollar. I, I was thinking of uh, David Niven, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. But he's American, right? He's not British. Well, he could be British. We don't know. Oh, we don't know. He's, he's we a... did hear him speak. The commercial still exists that was done for this phone company, which I cannot remember. It paid very well, and the animation was really beautiful, but only wow. 30 seconds long. <laughs> but uh, Klasky Chupo did, they did bring in an Eastern European illustrator to work on Politeness Man and the illustrations, well, they were full of existential angst. They had nothing to do with that <laughs> 1930s style that I was thinking of, like, like uh, you know, Captain Easy or uh, Dick Tracy. Well, you did have a chance in Hollywood with... Uh... Meatballs. I did. I did. I yeah. got. They put me up at the uh, Roosevelt Hotel on Hollywood Boulevard. There. That's your uh, best-selling book. Tried to yes. <laughs> come up We're with talking an idea. about the, the book you did with Judy, your your wife. The meatball book. I happened to be out there for that meatball book too, where they were working on a movie for it. So I stopped in at uh, at uh, Sony Animation while I was visiting Klasky Chupo to talk about doilies, uh, and. Uh, they were really off track with uh, the meatball book. They had uh, brought in these two French directors who thought that uh, they thought that the food should come down raw from the sky, <laughs> and then the <laughs> French chef would take the raw food in his kitchen where there were dancing girls, like Spice Girls, kicking their legs in the air, the cinnamon and the and the nutmeg and the allspice, the chorus line, and the French chef would put it all together. I said, but then what about the pancake falling on the school? That's every kid's favorite page. That pancake could not fall from the sky. You'd have to have flour and water and the whole thing, and how would they get it on the school? So I think the two women who were working on the film at the time uh, thought that, uh, there was some logic to my complaint, and the two French directors were replaced by a couple of nice American boys who had a pancake falling from the sky. Kill the crepe. Kill the crepe. Thank you. But what was really great- or cut the crepe. Yeah, right. What was so gratifying about that movie was those uh, plastic toys that were in every a Happy Meal at McDonald's. Uh, kids could choke on some of my work. <laughs> it was great. It was so gratifying. That's great. Yeah, I knew that I could die happy with a, a happy meal in my hand. 
So that was a great moment. Uh, and to go to the premiere too, which I did not. No, you didn't. Uh, they set up a little premiere for us on uh, 50, uh, 56th and uh, Madison Avenue in the Sony building. Were you a little worried about the way it came out? I bring my own red out? carpet. Okay. Were you a little concerned about how it may have came out and you didn't want to attend your premiere? No, I thought they did a great job. They, oh, when they true. looked at the picture book, they said, this book, this book lacks two things. It's missing a love interest and a quest. And we will <laughs> give you a love interest and a quest because that will make it last for an hour and 30 minutes. And gee, Paul McCartney wrote the music for it. Oh, right. He did. He wrote the, the ending song. It was so great. Oh, that is amazing. So, and I thought the animation that they did was really wonderful because the steak really looked like steak. Did they consult with you with like cells or anything? Or? Uh, they said, we'll wake you when it's over. Uh, and, you know, I cashed the check. They said, at one point, I did the ending for the movie in this crosshatch style. I did the ending for the movie, but then they felt, well, this will make it look like a kid's movie and we don't want it to look like a movie for kids. We want it to look like fun for people of all ages from eight to 80. Wonderful. So that was the end of my participation. And now how yeah. many books did you do with Judy? Well, we did you... maybe 10 of them, I'd say, maybe less. Yeah. And how many did you do? Judy was with Judy? great. I love working with Judy. But you divorced and you worked with. I mean, like. Oh, we did. We had. We were, we were. Uh, you know, we were a great team, not a great marriage. Because my wife and I can't do a barbecue together. I can't imagine <laughs> doing a book with an ex. <laughs> it was like ping pong. It was playtime. I'd send an idea to her. She because she went to Pratt. She had a great. She has a great visual sense. So she would often have visual ideas that I never would think of. And I it's, would have- It's interesting ideas. When, my, when I show my wife a joke and she doesn't get it or thinks it's not funny, then I know I'm on the right track. Uh -huh. yeah. Ron, I went to Pratt with- test. Ron, I went to Pratt with my wife too. She you hates did. me. Wow. She hates me. <laughs> yeah, I mean- <laughs> Where is she? Is she back there? She didn't have to go to Pratt to hate you, Bob. Come on. <laughs> oh. Words hurt, Michael. <laughs> yeah. Bob's wife is not Truth there. Truth hurts, Bob. Bob's wife Truth is not there, not in, there. His, in his cabin in the woods. He's completely isolated and alone. Yes. And oh, she, stays, she, she stays someplace where there's air conditioning, I think. In a different uh, state. See, and she took a car. <laughs> if you could see Bob right now, it looks like the Blair Witch Project, project in color. <laughs> this is all being filmed, and it's going to be all in the movie, Ron. I'm going to make sure okay. you sign that release. Okay. You're playing I have a question big part. about... I know that the Cloudy with the Chance of Meatballs was a movie, and then it was a sequel, and then it was on a uh, as a cartoon on Cartoon yes. Network. So right. it was it made was, into three different things from your show. book. Right. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, it is. It is. We've been very fortunate. Yeah. Very, Do you have any more? Are there any more Cloudy and a Chance of it's Meatballs? It's so hard world? to you know step into the same uh, river twice. Judy has tried. She's written a couple of sequels, but it's really difficult. You can't. You can't duplicate that. Well, you yeah. have to, there's always yeah. more places that are that are streaming content that need content. <laughs> Ron, no, I want to share that you've inspired yeah. me to accept an offer to do a children's book by by <laughs> doing more research about your work because I knew your work from the cartoons and National Lampoon, but I I'm not a child, Ron. I, I don't read the children's books, <laughs> but I did, and I really it was really um, imp so impressed by your children's book. And the new one again is the uh, witches. Um, the witch demands, the witch demands a retraction. Really a children's book, though. Yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah. Uh, now you're going to read that to your kids. Yeah, yeah. You don't and want it's to so read wonderful. Bob, you're a horrible father. Don't do that. Yeah, so I am. Uh, I am it. now taking on a children's book, and it's it really because of you. Well, great. And I thank you. And well, mom would be so proud of both of us. And what kind of a book is it? Oh, it's this. Um, it's about a guy who has ants in his pants and he's very nervous all the time. It's teaching kids how to handle anxiety. Oh, and, and me great. and Michael just wrote a book last year on stress, but we neglected to add the children. And we kind of like, you know, children <laughs> have been demanding our help. 
uh-huh. you know, it's amazing because yeah, like I had nice. I had kids and you would read them books and I think I read my kids everyone poops about 200 times yeah right. so after that i couldn't look at another kid's uh, what book. about the flatulent bunny you haven't gotten to that. Uh, i didn't get to that one uh yeah but i have to say my son i didn't realize you had illustrated this was a huge fan as well as the book of oj's legal pad oh yeah that was and great. and he wasn't born yet during, mm. he was born in 2000 and he learned about oj during during the Netflix show. Uh, <laughs> then he found this book. He goes, look at this, dad. This is great. This is What funny. a great book that was. Yeah. And uh, I looked at it and I, I said, wow, that's, that was quite an effort. And, but he, uh, I'm sure he still has it. And he still to this day thinks OJ is in, innocent because of <laughs> Netflix. Uh, well, that book was uh, an, an, an inspired idea from John Boswell, the book agent. Uh, sold 375,000 copies, who's counting, uh, 19 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. Wow. And uh, See, you can take of advantage money. of current events. Well, Bob. John, John. Can... Got to work on that. Yeah. Ron, do you have a backstory that's kind of interesting from those OJ days? A backstory about OJ? Yeah, well, you know, working on that book. Did you have any? The book was um... done practically overnight. I had a ball pen and a legal pad to work on. That's a back. <laughs> that's a back story. Yeah, it had to be done very, very quickly. Well, like how fast so, did you work? I think it was done in a month. I had to go. I have the doodle page was the hardest page of all. Uh, I had to copy from uh, John Boswell, who was a person who he was the book packager. I mean, he put together Henry Beard and me and his idea and sold it to a publisher. Uh, John was highly wired with caffeine, and he would do the <laughs> most uh, exotic and complex doodles. So I copied his doodles for that neurotic, uh, neurotic OJ doodle page. And were you watching the, the trial? Backstory. Were you watching the trial day I by day? It. I did watch it, but uh, don't ask me to explain it. I can't. And, and the, okay, I won't even yeah. ask you if you thought OJ was innocent or guilty. <laughs> Let's just try to keep this. Did you have to work directly yeah. with Henry Beard a lot? Henry and I were always best friends when we were doing a book. And then afterward, they were, we didn't know each other. But he, it was I mean, great working with him. I, I think at one Lampoon function, I met his brother. Oh. <laughs> but I didn't meet him because Henry at that, Henry's kind of a reclusive uh, at that time. And he was, he would like, he wasn't, he was never out. And he wouldn't do like interviews and stuff for like a very long time. Like after mm-hmm. leaving, when he left Lampoon, he left, he left Lampoon, like, boom, I'm he out. He went to the golf course. Yeah. He was mm-hmm. like, F you guys, I'm out of here. Literally. Cause he got yeah. paid to leave and he left and that was it. He like just cut, cut ties. And then when they made the documentary, um, uh, Doug Triello, I think is the guy that made the documentary. He did finally get to interview Henry after like going through other people to get like this guy's cool you can talk to him and then he got the interview but they didn't think they Uh were going to get Henry Mm. but that's amazing that you had a close working relationship with Henry Beard who's to me we did a couple of books together yeah we did uh uh, the zen for cats which I did in the uh, sumi a style which was wonderful to do wow like uh ink painting style which I studied Uh intensively at that time and we also did after the lampoon, John, be- John, by the way, George Barkin was the name of the editor of the lampoon. So what is his sister's name? Ellen. Ellen Barkin. Ellen Barkin. Right. Oh, Ellen Barkin. So <laughs> Ellen Barkin. Up, uh, up Ellen the long tree. Barkin. Yeah. Yeah. So we. She- Loves her in Buck- Buckaroo Banzai, by the way. <laughs> oh, she was really good there. So. Uh, <laughs> John Boswell, Henry Beard said, Ron has just left the lampoon or it has left him. Let's think of a book for Ron. So they thought of a book called The Way Things Really Work. So it's why everything goes wrong. And Henry and I wrote that together. And I illustrated that book. Uh, It's, you know, things like why uh, the bread always falls jelly side down when you drop a piece of bread. Yeah. Things like that. Very existential. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or gravity. 
isn't yeah. it isn't it weight related uh, it's the wrath of god is oh, right. why you know all chinese why airlines lose your luggage at that time <laughs> airlines were losing luggage they don't anymore and why all chinese food tastes the same things like that i like how people think that they need to find you a project do you remember they any did. time did you remember a time ever that you felt like I'm, what am I going to do next? It sounds like you've always been busy. Always waiting for the phone to ring. I used to walk the halls there of that building that my studio was in, in tears, thinking that the phone would never ring again. You know, you're the was... cover of the American bystander, this current issue. <laughs> you're you're Those everywhere. Those were years of high anxiety. Two kids in private school, a home in the Long Island, an expensive apartment in New York, uh, a wife who's withholding all the money from <laughs> we won't go there Bob, Bob but, is your Bob is your illegitimate son <laughs> who, had, who needed support Bob yes and uh, I was uh, walking the halls and uh, I was the town crier of the Upper West Side so does everyone come to you with their book idea and pitch it and... of course they think I can help them uh, get their children's book published yeah so I've got I can't this... get one published myself well me I've and Michael this... have ideas for you yeah uh, yeah I've Michael. got this great idea for a kid's book where everyone has an idea for a kid's book <laughs> so it's like you know your your uh, opulent alphabet it's the opulent book kids book idea yeah that's a great idea I love that is there, is wait 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 good? Ron Reality don't commit based. Reality. Please don't commit. Listen to my idea first. Okay. Last night, I dreamt <laughs> I am in an electronics store, right? And Danny DeVito is performing stand up, right? Uh huh. I don't want to go into any more until we talk, but yeah. let's, after this okay. interview, let's make a couple of calls. Yeah. So, yeah. what kid knows who have your Danny girl call my girl? Okay. Okay. You have your girl call my girl, and uh, we'll set up a lunch. Do, do you well, then understand? I'm pitching my book to Marty. You guys, you're gonna you're gonna okay. be crying. Okay. All right. You want to go ahead with that? Speaking now? speaking of books, we should talk more about this amazing oh, book that yeah. you could buy right now. The Witch yes. Demands a Retraction. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ron's well, illustrations on right now. We can Ron's mention where we can get it. Book are amazing. So Thanks, the illustrations Marty. in this book are great. And one of the things I like most, I mean, the the great stuff about your art is you hide little like your details, like your little jokes that you put in there. Yeah. Are wonderful, and I mean that's kind of like a comedic artist. Uh, same with uh, with Bob and Shaw. Is you guys visually put little visual jokes in yes. in the illustrations and in the cartoons and in the children's books. And I, I think it's you know how do you how do you do that? Like when you when you're doing a, a like a spread or you're doing a thing and you think of a couple of little visual gags to pepper in that maybe aren't in the text. Like, where do you come with your with your special, your special hidden jokes, Ron? Well, dra drawing for me is uh, as an only child is a form of self entertainment. So if I think of something funny, I'll uh, I'll uh, put it in a drawing. Do you tell I anyone, or you just myself? Yeah. <laughs> you just keep it to yourself and let everyone else uh, discover sometimes, it. Sometimes, you know, the, I call it time release humor. So yeah. it's a way of keeping things fresh. You I call it your a drawing. I, I call it your Nina. You're hiding your knees Nina. here and there. Yeah. Ron, one of your- uh, He did a portrait of me once that I tore up and threw away. I, oh no. I tell you where that, where that dumpster is with that uh, uh, Hirschfeld portrait of Ron. Yeah, where, he, where did he stick his Nina on you? Yeah, I tell him where to stick it. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a horrible portrait. I'm, I looked really demonic. It's worth millions. Ron, I have a question from a fan that ties into something you just said. A fan of yours is asking, Ron, you write and illustrate your own ingenious word puzzles, which sometimes consist of huge, complicated scenes. How did you get into that? And this is by fan Robert Layton, who says oh, he's worked- Robert Layton, the puzzle genius. He's a bum, I know. He says he worked <laughs> on a few projects over the years with you, but he's only met you once and remembers that you wear fantastic ties, which I will tell the audience now that you are not, you're tieless. You are not wearing a tie. They're tieless. They're all in a storage unit 25 miles away. <clears throat> They'll be coming up in tied. Sotheby's. <laughs> yeah, so, they're so disintegrating you... in the heat down there in Hyde Park. Go ahead. <laughs> 
did <laughs> did you get inspired to do complicated scenes? Was there someone who you kind of saw as an inspiration to to go in that direction? Mad Comics, of course. Ah. Will Elder was mm. a master at hiding things, hiding yeah. jokes in his illustrations. I met Will Elder at uh, John Boswell's The Book Packages once upon a time. I was so so great to meet him. But did I, I didn't tell you about Ludwig Bemelman's ghost. Oh, please. My mentor sure. was Irvine Metzel, the man who showed me the nude lady at the Society of Illustrators. He was Ludwig Bemelman's ghost artist. I have a, I have a facsimile, because I couldn't afford the original, of a note written to Irvine Metzel from Ludwig Bemelman saying, you get all the royalties from Madeline in Paris. And he got all the royalties from Madeline in Paris, although neither man lived much longer than six months after that note was written. He got all those royalties within those six months because he actually drew Madeline in Paris. So uh, Irvine Metzel was a great mentor and uh, a sarcastic, sarcastic old man when I met him, full of uh, wit and acerbic humor. So that was the, the the Bemelman's ghost story that I referred to. Wonderful. I, I want to ask you, have you been to Bunny's parties out on Long Island? Bunny's parties? Bunny Bunny's. hosts his parties. I know you work with Randy Jones and a lot of people who were all close friends oh. with Bunny. And I used to drive and shuttle them back and forth to the party once a year. And I'm, I assume that you and me missed each other, but uh, that you have attended. Was the that's on the South Fork? It's actually on the North Fork. It's oh. where you know the uh, the Lockhorns estate. <laughs> this is kind of an eyes wide check sort of deal, right? Yeah, well, Marty uh, could well, cut I... this all out. This is very inside baseball. Yeah, I mean, I had Harrison Cutchog on the North Fork, but I never went to any of Bunny's parties. You know what so... I'm finding about you, Ron, is that you're so busy that you don't. Really, you're not really a party animal because really, you know, people slipping things under the door for you and stuff like that. <laughs> and I think that is it fair to say that you're a workaholic? If there's work, yes, <laughs> I will work on it. I love to work. I started working when I was 12 and uh, I really miss uh, working very hard. So if you have any work, please send it over. I'm, I'm sending it to yeah, Danny DeVito. Painting the porch here. Okay. In Red Hook. <laughs> what what is a, your with a number seven Windsor Newton watercolor brush is not my idea of work. Yeah, try the sable brush; it'll work better. <laughs> Kolinsky sable, we love them. There. Yeah. Well, well, Ron, let me ask you a, 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 another question: Is what is your philosophy for a good <laughs> book? I'm doing a book. Everyone listening right now, everyone's working on a book. What would do you have like a sort of a mantra that you say to yourself that when you're working on a book that you know what is like your north star? No, what do you mean the north star? You just have uh, like yeah. a, a no you, that you know what you need to accomplish in the scenes or wherever you're trying to to meet a goal or if you're just playful and having fun and you're not even thinking about it i'll bet you're really good at this you must be you must be good at what yeah. <laughs> no. setting up a scene creating a scene telling a story with pictures you know well you're the oh, master yeah. that's why yeah I mean, <laughs> I, people would want to hear if you did have like sort of a philosophy for instance when you're sketching out whether it's meatballs or the the, the new book the witch demands a retraction. If you had a, a sort of a plan of attack of how to come up with the sequences. You know, it's all very intuitive. There's no plan. Ah. It's just intuitive. <laughs> I don't think about a plan rationally. I know when something is going badly and when something is going well. And I make adjustments accordingly. So it is all intuition. Oh, that's great. It's hard to put it into a rational framework. I could never do that. That sounds like yeah. the fun way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's all feeling and intuition. I think that would be the, uh, the, the first and last lesson that you teach at uh, art, art school. <laughs> You'd say, hello, welcome students. It's all intuition. You're, if you're, if you're going to fail, you're going to fail. And if you're going to succeed, you're going to succeed. Class dismissed. <laughs> and it's a lesson that haunts you, Marty, for like 40 years after that. Uh, yeah. No, there are two... 
there are rules, you know, about what looks good and what doesn't. I mean, there are compositional rules. I mean, wh what about John Nagy? He taught us that everything in nature is made up out of the cube, the cone, the ball, and the cylinder. And you have to follow those rules. He was a crackpot. <laughs> I can still draw John a beautiful Nagy cube. Is a crackpot? Didn't he teach you to draw a covered bridge? And aren't you still grateful <laughs> how many for years, that today? How many years of therapy did I have to take to unlearn that? <laughs> Didn't you ever get his his art instruction kit? In I did. I did. did. Yeah, uh -huh. my grandmother, she gave it to me and stuff, and we all did that. But, um, you know, you have to unlearn that sort of things to make up your own rules. And, and I, I think that um, everyone does have their own rules in their head of knowing why something works and doesn't. Mm. You just mentioned your composition. That is something that does stand out when seeing your work too, is how at ease it is with your composition. It's so welcoming. You have a nice balance Thank in all your you. pieces Thank that you. I really Thank like. You. Thank you. Thank you. Everything should be in three sizes, large, medium, and small. Right? You, it never looks <laughs> awkward with your drawings. I'm writing all Thank this you. down, by the way. So <laughs> okay. I think you're going to see a real uptick in my uh, quality. <laughs> okay, great. Dominant, subdominant, and subordinate. I learned that at Brad. Oh, uh, wait, that's the Lockhorn yeah. party again, isn't it? <laughs> they hate each other. On the North Fork? I never, never heard of it. Where was this? On East Egg. It was like, yeah, it was right near the Gatsby and right oh. next to Billy Joel. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's, that's, it was all these weird, that's uh, Western it was all these cartoonist secret sex parties. Exactly. I don't think anybody well, so I'm going to well, do a cartoon that just okay Gatsby. <laughs> that's the Gold yeah. Coast. The he's not gold. great. He's just okay. Ron, Marty wasn't invited, so he's a little bitter. <laughs> <laughs> Ron, Ron, what are you working on now? Is there anything that you could share with Besides us? Besides the front working? porch? I just did something for uh, Michael at uh, at American Bystander. Aside from the cover? Yeah, I did a recruiting poster for Doorman. Uh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> doorman wanted. Right. Yes, right. Uh, Here's the doorman. Become, the line is become a doorman and become an adored man. Oh. That is right in theme with cartoon pad where all cartoonists are <laughs> <That's> doormats. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of Bruce McCall and his great ad, oh, Lumber Bruce. Counters Eat Steak. <laughs> Ron, I, I don't want to Bruce keep McCall. you forever, but no, that's a, this is fine. I hope you come back tomorrow night. Is we it... will. Is the porch <laughs> done yet? Because we don't want to make footprints. Okay. <laughs> yeah, don't porch, look... I haven't painted that part of the porch. Okay. Not unless you're going to walk up the banister, will you? make a footprint well, you know when as bob stalks you all the time he'll he'll be knocking on the window well he's here he can welcome here 265 okay, spring lake road red hook new york do you Thank have you. air conditioning no oh heck we Sorry, have bob. Two i fans. tried that's it i'm bringing okay. my children's book pitch ron get ready okay. for rejection slips Okay. <laughs> Listen, um, is there anything you think that we didn't cover that you'd like to share with us? No, uh, we, we've done there's so, so much. much to talk about because yeah. you've done so much. Thank you know, you, and we didn't talk about Electric Magazine and some of the other oh. things you did because we we could save that for tomorrow night. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll do a. Let's do a part two. Yes, we'll do a sequel. Yeah, we'll do a part two, and then we'll do a cartoon, and then we'll do a musical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks. I, I'm going to speak for so many cartoonists. Thanks okay. for inspiring Thank us. You. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Marty, for all you've done to promote this baby. Yes, everyone yeah. go out and buy The Witch Demands a Retraction, Fairy Tale Reboot for Adults. Yeah. On sale now. Wonderful art. Very it's, funny. Thank you. Uh, fairy Tales. Ron, where do you uh, have your work on, on social media? Do you have like um, on Instagram or do you have I a have website? an Instagram thing, which I use to promote this and uh, my own work. Can you share the address? Website. Do leave website. Oh, can you share the website address? Sure. It's Ron Barrett Tart. Or Ron Barrett Art dot com. It could be read as Ron Barrett Tart. Tart. He does it all books. R R E T T A R T. That was Robert Crumb's idea. You should be Ron Barrett Coquette. Or Crowfoot. Okay. Fit in with the meatballs. Well, well, so go. everyone go visit uh, Ron and his work there. Please check it out. Check out the book at meatballshumorous.com.
And uh, that was a great interview, Michael. Thank you, thanks. Tom. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Bob. Give my regards to Overlook Terrace. I'll say hello to mom. That's going to be yeah. it. Everyone That's stay it. funny, stay cool, oh, and stay yeah. in school. Keep on smiling. Bye. Thanks, guys. Uh, Michael. Yes, I sir. like that. That was fascinating. I learned a lot. Despite us, I learned a lot. That's the point of the cartoon thing. You always walk away saying, I learned so much this episode. I'm going to watch it and listen to it again. What's amazing is you know someone from like one or two books or some sort of awareness of them that didn't sort of, they unfurl their lives before you and you realize how much work and effort went into those moments. Yeah, I know. I kind of feel a little bit lazy from hearing all the things you've accomplished. You know, it does make you see like, geez, kind of get off my ass. Come on, Bob. Well, anyway, it was a great episode. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening in. That's going to be it. Stay funny, stay cool, and stay in school.